2024 coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. I am here in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina for the Hootie and the Blowfish Monday after the Masters Golf Tournament. I'll show you some of the exciting things that happened today. Also, it is Jackie Robinson Day in Major League Baseball. Hence, me wearing his Brooklyn Dodgers number 42. Uh, on today's show, folks, uh, we'll be talking about uh, a sister from Fisk University uh, who won a major gymnastics competition over the weekend, coming to the, becoming the first HBCU uh, student to actually win that competition. We will be joined on the show uh, by the Fisk University uh, gymnastics coach, uh, as well as uh, uh, Morgan Price, the young woman uh, who won that. And so uh, a huge, uh, huge. Huge uh, win. Also in the cheerleading competition, North Carolina, North Carolina A&T, they also won over the weekend. So lots of great news from our HBCUs in New York City. Donald Trump, uh, his uh, criminal trial begins today. What does he do? Continue to flout uh, the gag order uh, by attacking the judge uh, in the case. So we'll tell you exactly what took place there. Also, in our Fit Live Win segment, uh, we continue to focus on National Minority Health Month uh, by discussing uh, some of the most significant challenges facing African Americans, uh, mistrust of the medical industry uh, involving a number of areas. And so we'll uh, tell you uh, all about that. Uh, also, on today's show, uh, the FBI is opening a criminal investigation to the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. We'll have uh, those details as well. That and more right here. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. It is time to bring the funk. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Jury selection began today in New York City in the historic trial of thug-in-chief Donald Trump. He, of course, is the first uh, former occupant of the Oval Office. Y'all know I do not call him president at all. Uh, to go on trial for criminal charges, this case centers around a potential sex scandal cover-up that took place just days before the 2016 uh, presidential election. The, the uh, trial begins today with jury selection, uh, which, due to the large pool of prospective jurors, literally could take up to two weeks. The charges from Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg stem from a $130,000 payment Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, made to adult film actor Stormy Daniels at the end of the 2016 election to keep her from going public with an allegation that she and Trump had a sexual affair. Trump then repaid Cohen in installments marked as legal fees in company records. Now, Trump actually denies having an affair with Daniels. Now, we know he's a liar. And what you also have, you also have all of these people who are making excuses for Donald Trump. I mean, my goodness, uh, Geraldo Rivera, Clay Travis, all these people because they cannot stand the fact that this is moving forward. So they want to make excuses for him. Now, here's the problem. There's a sign over the Supreme Court. Literally, it is etched in stone. It says equal justice under law. What that means is it doesn't matter who you are in the United States. It doesn't matter if you're rich, if you're poor, if you're a politician or you're not, equal justice under law. But so many people have continued to make excuses for Donald Trump and he has never learned his lesson because, for him, he figures I could do whatever it is 
that I want. Let's talk about panel right now. Uh, Dr. Alma Congo, to being a senior professor of lecturer, School of International Service at American University. Renita Shannon, former, former Georgia State Representative out of Atlanta. Also, we have Dr. Julianne Malvo. She's an economist and author uh, out of Washington, D.C., president emerita of Bennett College. Alma Congo, I'm going to start with you. I mean, he, he, here's the thing that is amazing to me. Um, this thug, that's what he is. He's a liar. He is a tax cheat. He has cheated on multiple wives. Uh, he refuses to pay his bills. Uh, he trashes everyone. He talks about everyone. There's no level of accountability. And to watch people continue to make excuses for this man, frankly, it's pathetic. It's pathetic. It's sad. It's it's and and it's like what they're making excuses for. I mean, everybody knows, you know, they call this the hush money trial case, but we know it's also about election interference. And we're talking about a man who paid off Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal, the people who were involved in, in the porn industry, to keep his image as some, you know, to continue to try to court evangelicals, to try to show that he was Christian, that he was going to be, you know, quote unquote, uh, you know, uh, pro, pro life, or as we like to talk about here, anti-abortion. And he tried to keep coming off on this. And after that Access Hollywood tape came out, people thought he was done. People like Paul Ryan, you know, disinvited him from events. And people thought that, you know, they should really try to get rid of him. But that he had a lot more support than we thought, because when Paul Ryan tried to uninvite him from that event, Paul Ryan got booed by the people in the audience. So the fact of the matter is, Roland, I feel like at the end of the day, he probably still could have won if this tape came out, or if, if information about this these payoffs came out, because that's how much so many people in his base wanted him, and when you talk about so much of the Hillary hate. But right now, he is there. He's got to be quiet quiet. He can't intervene the way he wants. He can't interject the way he wants. And he has to be there every day, Roland. And so we don't know what's going to happen in the actual trial itself. We don't know if there's going to be a, a stealth juror who's going to get on there and be like a you know rabid Trump supporter. We don't know. But the fact of the matter is that the process of accountability, criminal accountability, has finally started at least one of these trials. And he can't get out there and try to control the narrative. If he really wants to control the narrative, get up there and take the stand which we also know that he's not going to do. Overall, this is a good day. And for all of those people who are trying to excuse him, you know, they got enough stuff in their closet they don't want coming out either. But they need this man to be their front man. They need this man to be their winner at all costs, despite all of the people who, whose careers have been destroyed over this man. Giuliani, Weisselberg, who's in prison right now at like, what, 80-something years old? Everybody's lying on their sword for this man who will never do the same for them. But the process is moving, even though slowly. And it's a good day. Renita, the thing for me is very simple, uh, and that is um, his supporters, they literally make excuses for everything. Oh, this is political. If it wasn't him, they wouldn't be doing this. He can flout the law. He can break the law. And for them, it's like, all right, whatever. We really don't care. Right. They're making excuses for him, which is also a trial and true um, tactic of the way that white supremacy is kept intact in this country, which is that when white men um, have done something that obviously they need to be held accountable for from a legal perspective, they people tend to make excuses for them, for them and do whatever they can to shield them from accountability. And that helps to hold white supremacy um, intact. It's just one of the benefits of white supremacy. And so this case is really important, mm -hmm. you know, him being held accountable as well as the other um, charges that he's been charged with and folks trying to get accountability for other things that he's done because because we are supposed to have a justice system that is supposed to be equal for everyone. And as you mentioned in the introduction, you know, folks are looking at this. Unfortunately, too many people in this country, their interaction and what they've seen of our criminal justice system has been that there are some people, generally rich white men, who happen to always be above the law and escape accountability. And so holding Donald Trump accountable is going to do a lot more than um, actually hold him accountable. It's going to do a lot to actually uh, make people feel at least just a step closer to believing that we are moving one step closer to equal justice in this country. And that is important because that is what, you know, people believing that there's a justice system um, is what separates uh, people from just deciding to get their own justice and just doing vigilante justice. So it is important for the country. Juliana, um, what's also interesting is to watch these lying, hypocritical, 
atrocious, shameful, and despicable white conservative so-called Christians <laughs> make every excuse possible. People like Franklin Graham, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. And that's all they do. They excuse this man's behavior. They embolden his shameful behavior, and they know he is not even remotely a Christian. It never has been, but he's wrapped himself around that, and they've allowed him to do so. The fact is that when we look at so-called Christianity, I say so-called, I am a Christian, but I'm that kind of Christian. I'm not the Christian who went to church and then after church went to the lynching. And this, these, these are the Christians, when we look at the defenders of the orange man, who basically believe in selective Christianity. So when they talk about feeding the hungry, but don't put any more money in any SNAP benefits. You talk about uh, clothe the naked, but don't do anything about public assistance. We can go down the list of their hypocrisies. And among their hypocrisies, there's a, I believe there's a commandment that says, thou shalt not commit adultery. I think there's such a commandment. Um, but apparently, all these holy rollers will make excuses for the orange man who has flagrantly committed adultery I don't know how many times. We can look at any number of things that they defend that defy the Bible, the commandments, and everything else. What they really are telling us, Roland, is that they prefer to win than to be Christian. They prefer to subjugate people, especially poor people, especially black people, especially immigrants, than to be Christian. There's nothing in the Bible that says once somebody crosses a border, they're no longer a human being. And the people who have come to the border, they've come at enormous cost. They didn't come to do anything but to survive. And yet we basically peripheralize them. So I, I reject their notion of Christianity. They're not behaving in a Christian manner. And, you know, they, you've got these uh, youth in these uh, conservative Christian churches wearing these little armbands that say, WWJD, what would Jesus do? But Jesus would not do Trump. That's what Jesus would not do. And we know this for a fact. And so the, the, all these spinning, uh, Geraldo, you know, I've been glued to the T. Well, not completely glued. So I did have to do some work. But watching off and on the television today, of course, I stay on CNN and MS. I can't have Fox in my house. But they, the clips of these people, and they're just telling lies. And now his new one is, he gave Stormy Daniel the money to save his marriage. What marriage? We, have you seen Melania lately? Girlfriend is going to get paid another couple mil to hang out for the campaign, and then she's going to keep it moving. But, in, but neither here nor there. The fact is that the question you raise about Christianity and the hypocrisy is the appropriate question. But the other question, equally, if not more important, is why do these people stick with him? Why do, the, the, you know, the work, white working class, who he's doing nothing for, who, who he's doing nothing for, they feel some affinity with him. And I'm not sure why. He's not coming to their house. Their grandkids are not oh, going to be... No, no, as, uh, look, look, look no, no, we know why. Because the bottom line is, he made clear, he is going to put uh, hardcore right-wing uh, evangelicals on the federal bench. He did that. And so what they've decided is, oh, we will overlook, all, overlook all of uh, your pathetic, uh, uh, narcissistic behavior to get what we want. It's also about power. I'm going to go to a break when we come back. Uh, I'm going to show you what happened on yesterday on ABC This Week. When New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu was questioned by George Stephanopoulos. And he explained, he showed you exactly how they operate and what matters to them. It's not morals. It's not values. It's not ethics. It's not principles. It's power. You're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach financial literacy. Without it, wealth is just a pipe dream. And yet, half of our schools in this country don't even teach it to our kids. You're going to hear from a woman who's determined to change all that, not only here, 
but around the world. World of Money is the leading provider of immersive financial education for children ages 7 to 18. We provide 120 online and classroom hours of financial education. That's right here on Get Wealthy on Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. The enormous impact of race, education, and affirmative action in America. And how, believe it or not, white America is starting to feel a little bit of the pain. Dr. Natasha Waraku joins us with a case study of one suburban community and how it reacted when the minority students started to excel. Most people didn't say this explicitly, but was that, you know, the academics are getting, standards are getting higher in part because of the Asian kids and that is making our kids really stressed out. So we need to reduce the amount of homework teachers are allowed to um, assign. She shares a perspective that you don't want to miss. That's on the next Black Table, only on the Black Star Network. What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Latasha from the A. And you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, I've said to y'all on numerous occasions on this show, on others, Republicans are who they are. It is about power. Don't believe any of these people when they stand in front of the cameras and they're grandstanding and they're just making all of their pronouncements. That stuff means nothing. It's all about power. And New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu who supported Nikki Haley for the Republican nomination, who has trashed Donald Trump in the past, he showed his whole ass yesterday on ABC This Week with George Stephanopoulos. And so, we're about to play it for you right now, and you're going to see it for yourself. And remember, I was on the same show, September 2021, with Chris Christie, and, and I sat there, and I said it then. Now, I ain't been back on the show since, but everything that I said was absolutely true. Every single thing. And so, we got the stupid video ready? All right, guys, let's go. When y'all see this, I mean, it, it's, it's, they, they, they tell you. And so, th th this is why I crack up when, when, I, when I hear these people talk about, oh, I'm not going to vote, these things don't matter, uh, you know, you're sitting here, you know, shilling, these people do not care. They do not care. It's all about control. Watch. Governor Chris Sununu, who worked against Donald Trump during the primaries, has now endorsed the former president. Governor, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, you bet. History being made tomorrow, that criminal trial. Will your support for Donald Trump continue even if he's convicted in Manhattan? Yeah, I, look, I, this this trial is not going to have major political ramifications that a lot of people, I think, think it may have. And when it comes to th these issues, people see it more as reality TV at this point. They, they really do. And so, um, you know, whether it's a conviction or what that conviction looks like, um, a lot of folks, they conflate all four of these different trials that he's in. I don't think it's good that he's going to be in the court, uh, have to be in there probably three days a week, uh, you know, for, for a number of weeks. That takes him off the campaign trail. He'll probably go back on the campaign trail and almost like rehash what's going on. He'll try to victimize it, um, and, and that has worked for him, right? I mean, this has been going on for over a year, well, and his poll numbers never seem to go down because of the issue. Well, yeah, you're going to politics, though. I'm asking you about right and wrong. You think it's, you're, you're comfortable with the idea of supporting someone who's convicted of a, oh, no. of a federal crime as president? No. 
I don't, I don't think any American is comfortable with any of this. Uh, they don't like any of this, of course. But, I mean, when it comes to actually you know, looking at, the, at each of these trials, um, as they kind of take place, whether it's this year or next year, as they kind of line up, the, the, right now this is about an election. Right. This is about politics. That's what people are judging this on. And the, the ultimate you know, decision will be will be in November to see where people are. But for, for months and even over a year, we've heard that these are the things that are going to bring Donald Trump down. It's not. And to think that the American public is going to be massively swayed by this uh, politically or otherwise, um, that's that's not going to happen. But I'm asking if, if whether anything, you're going to be Trump swayed has, by as, it. Yeah. I'm at, you're a governor. No. You're an elected no. official. I'm asking whether you're going to be swayed by it. Yeah, look, nobody should be shocked that the Republican governor is supporting the Republican president. You know what the real story is? The average American that has gone from Biden back to Trump, the average American that is feeling inflation and all these other issues that says, look, through all this, all this whether there's a conviction or not, we want a culture change in Washington, D.C., and we'll continue to support the former, pres former President Trump. That's the real story, right? That Trump is leading in the polls across America in, in a lot of these different polls. So no one should be surprised by, by my support. What the, I think the real discussion is, you know, America's moving away from Biden. That's how bad Biden has become as president. There's just no doubt about it, right? You can't ignore you inflation. You can't ignore the border and say that, that these issues in the courthouse are going to be the one thing that brings Biden back in, into office. It's not going to happen that way. Y'all heard all of that utter flat-out nonsense? This is what I said on the same show, September 2021. I appreciate the speech, uh, Governor, but the reality is this. Um, you have to admit, Sarah, you have to admit the role that you played in putting the person in leadership who is driving conspiracy theories. It's one thing to condemn them after the fact, but you have to own up to the role that you played in putting the person in power. The time they both ran campaigns against No, 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 no. First off, I don't want to admit anything to you. Can I finish? First off, I'm not finishing you. And second, I ran against Donald Trump in 2016. You also coached him. You ran against Donald Trump Here's the deal. You ran against him. But when a person has principles, morals, and values, they do not support them even if you lose. And what they say is, what they say is I choose patriotism and the country yeah. over party I, and power. And the problem was too many Republicans chose yeah. power in riding yeah. with Donald right. Trump as opposed to patriotism yeah. in America. Sleep, I'll sleep fine tonight with you judging my morals. Well, guess what? As a it's voter, as a, as a yeah. voter who has 13 right. nieces and nephews, what I also want yeah. to see in America are Republicans and Democrats who have the guts to stand up yeah. to narcissists, to folks who lie, to folks who see the human and led yeah. a country in the wrong direction. And what that yeah. man has unleashed on this country, any Republican who stood with them has to own it and accept the role that they played. Yeah, well, that's fine. I'll accept the role that I played in the 2016 election running against him, and I'll accept but the you, role... But you have let, him, let him finish his point now. Let him Excuse finish his point. Me. And I'll accept the role that I played in my belief that Hillary Clinton was not the right person to be president. We all get to make choices, Roland, in this democracy. I made my choice. I'm on record of my choice, and I'm not walking away from my choice. But it does not preclude me from being able to be critical when the person that I did support does things that I am against. And so this false choice that you're trying to set up, that false? Uh, it's, it's a false choice and one that the American people are not going to buy either. Ah, uh, here you go, the false choice. Renita, these people, again, it's power. They do not care they do not care if this man is paid off a porn star. They do not care that he grabbed women by the vagina. They do not care how shameful, despicable he has been. They do not care about his racism when it came to housing. They do not care how he lies. They do not care how he crapped on, uh, crapped on our troops who lost their lives and how he, frankly, how he called them names. General John Kelly, four star retired general, uh, of course, gold star family member, talked about that as well. This is who this man is. They do not care. So I need all the people who are sitting on the fence who are talking about, oh, you know what, you know, I'm not going to vote to understand. These people don't have morals or values or principles or ethics. They are going to enact some of the most gross 
disrespectful, shameful policies that are going to have a negative impact on African Americans and others. And people better understand there's no such thing as a bottom with Donald Trump. It doesn't exist. It goes lower than the ocean floor. Well, Sununu, in what he said, actually uh, let the cat out of the bag, which we all knew, which is it really doesn't matter what Donald Trump does, they're going to support him. And I think that even includes him being convicted um, in any of these cases, criminally being, a, you know, having been convicted of felonies or anything. It doesn't matter. They're still going to vote for him because they're not voting for him based on his actions. They're not voting on him based on morals. They're voting for him because they know that he will continue to do what it takes and be very bold about holding white supremacy intact. They are voting to keep whiteness together, and they know that that is what he will do because that is what he campaigns on. And so I think, and this is what I was saying earlier about, you know, why it's important that he's held accountable is because when you look at the average poor white person here in the South, the, the Southern strategy, for the most part, still works. They know Donald Trump doesn't care about them, and they know that he's not going to do anything to help them. They know that. But what they are banking on is that if he gets reelected, he will keep whiteness want, in, in, intact for the most part and the benefits of white supremacy. And so even if they are not going to have any money and even if he's not going to do anything economically for them, even if he's not going to do anything to make their life better, at least they will still be able to hold on to whiteness and that, will buy, that can buy them simple benefits like not being harassed as much by the police, um, not being over-incarcerated the way that our communities have been. That can buy them having an easier day in court if they do have to go to court for something. There are still Still things that don't cost money that whiteness can buy, and Donald Trump is basically advertising and campaigning on that he's going to make sure that those things stay intact in this country, and that's what Make America Great, uh, Make America Great Again is about. So, and, and uh, Julian, this is where, again, this is where people make the mistake. Well, they believe that we're operating by a set of rules. We, they believe that, oh, well, you know, the person does this. When the man trashed Senator John McCain as a POW and Republicans clapped, okay, that was it. They were done. And so people had better understand what these people want to do, what their intentions are. They're telling us what they're going to go after. And folks had better understand before it's too late. He is exactly laying out what his plan is. He plans to fire civil servants who are not aligned with his agenda. Obviously, all of the um, GS folks he's going to go after, um, government appointees, federal appointees he's going to go after. Um, and you know that in terms of African-American professionals, we tend to be overrepresented among those ranks. So any African-American person who works for the federal government and supports Trump basically is putting a knife to their own throat. But there are those who will do that because they've drank the Kool-Aid. And, and that's literally what's happening is we, people, you, I was talking to a guy the other day, one of my neighbors, which I rarely do, but I talked, the man was talking, he said, oh, don't you know he's just joking? I'm like, no, he's not just joking. Uh, but that, a lot of people think he's just joking or he's a little extreme or his rhetoric is out of order. No, his policies are out of order. The rhetoric we could potentially put up with is what he says he will do. And those who are reluctant to vote, Roland, I'm so disgusted. Um, they keep talking about what well, he hasn't done. Biden, President Biden has not done enough. You know, now we got another student loan reprieve. Um, there are some HBCUs. Do you think that President Trump, if a, a President Trump would support HBCUs? No. And we know that. We know that those states who have stolen money from HBCUs through the land-grant colleges. That's federal money. The federal government can play a better role. Trump isn't going to do that. And let's not talk about our rights, our abortion rights, our uh, reproductive health rights. And then just uh, today, the state of Iowa has banned um, any kind of treatment for trans children. They, they made it against the law. Now, you know, this goes to a, a orange man Supreme Court. They'll uphold that law. You know that, frankly, uh, when we look at it, he would speak in favor of such a law. We know that the Republican Party has been aligned against difference. Uh, these states that are passing laws against diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so people, discerning people 
um, they know, many of them know better. They know better. But like you said, er, when you set this uh, segment up, it's about power. It's about white supremacy. It's about fear of a black planet, fear that there are more and more African American, Latino, Asian young people who um, many, of course, line up with the orange man, but more are open and looking right. at their lives, their lives, and they're saying, no, we're not having this. So, but this is a fear. It's that fear. But, 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 but here's the thing on the Congo that, again, that, that I think people need to understand. For those people who are on the right, it doesn't matter. So he knows I can do what when he said I could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and I would not lose support. That yep. was not a lie. And so what I need people to understand is there are no rules here. They don't exist. Mm -hmm. And so you had better understand when this man is standing in front of rally saying, I'm going to deport Latinos, when he's saying the programs are going to attack, when he says, hey, I wish I had the power uh, like they do in England uh, to just decide when the election takes place. That's what they want to do. Bro, Believe I mean... them. And so and so, <laughs> so for Democrats, stop. This no, like I like all these idiot idiot journalists who know, oh, you know, uh, 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 President Biden, he needs to be calling, calling all these uh, these uh, people who did support Donald Trump. No, he don't. You better be locking and load. You better be locking and loading on Democrats saying if we don't get out to vote, if that fool may be back in and if he's back in. All the rest of these people, they know they've got an idiot in charge and they can do whatever they want because we know he can't read. We know he can't think. We know he's not smart. He just happened to sit there and soak in all of uh, the accoutrements of being president. When you talk about people needing to get on the ball, first of all, that video from 2021, it never gets old and it just has more resonance. And I'm sitting here, you know, looking at this, you know, right here with white fear, Roland, you got four sections in here. And, and the first three are all playing out. The first one was igniting the flame of white fear. And on page 15, part two of that was enter Donald Trump. You talked about that. You laid it out. He came in with this. Then you talk about defining the white fear manifesto, going to what Dr. Malvo was saying, redefining American history with the bans and everything else, DEI. And then chapter three, you, uh, section three, you talk about legislating and regulating through white fear. And that's them going after the courts. And, you know, so in those first three sections right there, it's all playing out. And we're seeing it with Sununu. We saw it with Ted Cruz before. We saw it with Mitch McConnell as well. I will support the Republican nominee regardless. That's my job as the Republican. And so when they don't care, how much do we care about? And I still feel, Roland, that there are still some people who kind of have that Susan Sarandon mindset of maybe we can handle four years of Trump. Maybe, you know, that's what we need right now. Maybe, like, maybe, maybe, maybe. And on every level, there's a certain level of complacency. I remember two weeks ago when we were on, and you played that, or three, when you played that Bill Maher video, when he was talking about the NBA and all this race stuff. Though he started off that segment by saying, I don't care who wins the election. That's how we started off. And so if people want to keep having that mindset, Donald Trump will be back and this country will get whatever it deserves. And if the Sununu video is not the latest one, because uh, Chris Christie started listening to you finally in this election, should have listened to you three years ago, right? But the fact of the matter is, if we don't get it on now, he's going to keep lying. I watched your segment when he was at the Chick-fil-A with the fake video of the black supporter. They're going to do everything they can to play dirty because it's about power. Project 25, it's about power. And so this is not the time for us to be cute and fancy and talk about sitting out or, oh, Biden's just not appealing to me. He's not calling me. He's not all of that. This is do or die. Like, die as a country, like do or die. And it's only going to get worse. And they're all falling in line once again. Not people are going to be like, not a lot of them are going to be like Mitt Romney, who said, hey, you get convicted of sexual assault of any sort, that's a, a disqualifier for me. They don't care. You've written the manifesto. It's time for us to get on the good foot because we only got a few months left to this American experiment if he gets in again. I simply want people to recognize what is at stake. 
I am not depending on any Republican to do what's right or just or fair because they want to be in control. So, folks, don't sit here and act like we didn't tell you if it happens. Going to a break. We'll be right back. Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Support us in what we do. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing on average $50 each at $4.19 a month, 13 cents a day. If you want to join our Bring the Funk fan club, send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App is Dallas Sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com We'll be right back. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit StartEngine.com slash Fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Terry and I, we couldn't play in the white clubs in Minnesota. It felt like such a, um, you know, strength through adversity type mm -hmm. moment that I think black people just have to go through. You know, we have to figure it out, you know? Right. We make, we make, you know, lemons out of lemonade, but there's a reason we rented a ballroom, did our own show, promoted it, got like 1,500 people to come out, clubs were sitting empty. They were like, where's everybody at? And they said, they're down watching a band you wouldn't hire. So it taught us not only that we had to be, we had the talent of musicians, but we also had the, ta had the talent of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a seat at the table. It's like, no, let's build the table. That's right. We got to build the table. And, That's right. And that was the thing. And of course, after that, we got all kinds of offers. Of course. Right, to come play in the clubs. But we didn't do it. We you said, like, no, we good. No, we're good. We're good. And that's what put us on a path of national. And of course, when Prince made it, then it was like, okay, we, we see it can be done. Jamia Pugh. I am from Coatesville, Pennsylvania, just an hour right outside of Philadelphia. My name is Jasmine Pugh. I'm also from Coatesville, Pennsylvania. You are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Stay right here. The FBI has launched an investigation into the bridge collapse, collapse last month. Uh, in Baltimore, Francis Scott Key Bridge, of course, was uh, nearly brought down in its entirety after uh, a uh, shipping container hit the bridge. On Monday, federal agents executed search warrants on the Dolly, a massive Singaporean flag cargo ship that which slammed into and brought down the bridge. Reports say the investigation review the events leading up to the ship's departure from the port and whether the crew knew of potential mechanical problems that would make it unsafe in the harbor. Of course, the bridge collapsed around uh, shortly before 2, 2 a.m. Uh, on March 26th after the ship crashed into a bridge column, according to the NTSB, Natural Transportation Safety Board. The vessel made mayday calls minutes before the crash, saying it had lost power and that a collision might have been possible. Eight construction workers were still on the bridge. Two were injured and survived, while the bodies of three others were recovered. The remaining three are presumed dead. And so that uh, invest investigation is going on. Well, one of the things that, that, that that's happening in Congress, to me, I think is pretty stupid. Uh, when you see this back and forth, um, um, uh, uh, Renita, of... Republicans uh, refusing to go along with the rebuilding of this bridge, saying that's not really what we pay for. You know, you know what's always amazing? Uh, these so-called fiscal conservatives, that's what they try to call themselves. But it's amazing when you have natural disasters or accidents in their states where they absolutely are rushing for federal aid. But, oh, this is Baltimore. Oh, this is Maryland. Oh, that's, those are blue, that's a blue city, blue state. And 
it's a black state, black mayor, black governor. So, yeah, we know we don't want to support uh, any of this. That's nonsense. Uh, this is a significant port that actually impacts millions of Americans. It goes beyond just a Baltimore or a Maryland issue. And you kind of cracked open something that um, I'll just kind of extend what you're saying about it being a black area, uh, blue it, democratically, is that the, one of the long games that Republicans have been playing, and they play this both at the local level, the state level, and the federal level, is that they want to make things harder in states that are democratically controlled and which happen to largely be black areas, so that in the end, people will feel like um, having uh, electing Democrats really does not do anything for my life, and it actually in some cases, um, can't even get some of the most simplest things done. And so I'm not surprised that they are lodging this argument. But like you said, whenever, you know, you think about Ted Cruz and um, when Texas needed hurricane relief money and how he then wanted to change everything that he had said about, you know, um, disaster aid and things like that. So, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of not surprised to see all of that. But the other thing that this kind of reminds me, too, which a lot of people don't think about, but as a lawmaker, it's one of those things that doesn't rank very highly um, when voters think about voting. But it's just that, you know, it's important to make sure that we have a strong system of regulations as it results, as it relates to um, safety for our industries that, you know, um, people are frequent, industries that affect the public, like utilities or like bridges, roads, things that, you know, affect everybody that people don't really mm -hmm. prioritize at a high level, but it's important. And so um, frequently you see the pushback of people saying, oh, well, there's too much regulation, things like that. But a lot of times these regulations are about safety. And so I'm interested to see what this investigation yields. And I wonder if um, some part of a, a lack of regulations will have anything to do with what they uncover, especially since they suspect that they that the uh, folks who were operating the vessel may have known that there were some there were some mechanical failures um, to this boat, or at least whoever owned this boat, they may have known there were some mechanical failures. Uh, absolutely. I'm a Congo. I think that this investigation, you know, you would think, going back to these Republicans, you know, given that this is a foreign-owned vessel, that people would be all about America first and let's do this investigation and see what happens. We, we also see that the owners of, of this ship, they're using laws that were used to, or, or policies that were used to protect, the, that the owner of the Titanic was using to try to prevent some of their, you know, having to possibly pay out and, and take responsibility for what happened. And I'm also glad to see that uh, the fam some of the families have also got their own lawyers involved to investigate this as well. And we see this across the country where companies, whether we're talking about oil spills, whether we're talking about train wrecks, whether we're talking about so many things, the company's going to do the first thing that they do is going to be to protect their own assets. But we have to see make sure that our government is, make is doing the right thing by the people on the ground. And we know that with Biden, he talks about making sure that everything is paid for, that they can cover. But we know if this was Trump, they wouldn't send any resources to towards that city because during COVID, Trump was talking about sending aid to cities that were only Republican, that, you know, that were red states. And so when we see this investigation right now, everybody, you know, FBI director, still a Republican, you know, these Republicans should get behind this, but they're going to politicize this in every way, shape and form just by using DEI as it relates to the mayor and the governor, as you mentioned before. And so this investigation needs to continue. Whoever needs to be held responsible and it needs to happen fast because I'm going to assume that a company this large has a, ba a great deal of lawyers at its disposal and knows the laws very well. And so I'm glad the FBI is in it right now. And I hope that this yields something that could be beneficial uh, for those families families and for the, the people of, of Baltimore, Maryland, and across the country, because like you said, we're all suffering from this right now. Uh, indeed. Uh, Julian? You know, the thing about what happened with the Francis Key Bridge is that it's not just a Baltimore or a Maryland issue. It's a national issue. We will see some um, reverberations in terms of the national economy. We will see some disruptions in the supply chain in the national economy because of this. And so it's very appropriate for there to be an investigation. But I would propose a further investigation, Roland. We know that 20% uh, of our nation's bridges are compromised. We know that insufficient investment in infrastructure is partially a function of this, these compromised bridges. It's why the American Council of Civil Engineers gives our infrastructure a C- minus grade. And we know that President Biden has done his best to spend money on infrastructure, but we know where the opposition has come from. So even as we look at the Francis Scott Key Bridge, we also need to look at the status of our other national bridges, because 
this could happen. There are five or six places uh, where this could happen again if there were such a, if this was completely an accident and everything was okay, but we know that everything was not okay. But what we know more than that is that our infrastructure is crumbling and Republicans do not want to invest in it. Any, as as uh, Renita said, opening up, anytime there's a tragedy in one of their states, oh yeah, let's fix it. But if it's a tragedy in a blue state, let's let it wither. And so uh, the investigation is a good thing, it's a great thing, but we really have to go beyond that. That's the bottom floor. And as we look up, we really have to look up at the status of our infrastructure, not just bridges, water. We still have challenges in Michigan uh, with water. And that Michigan is not the only place. I bet if we looked at our own back door, the District of Columbia, let's say, uh, we might find some challenges with water quality in our schools as well. So this just reminds us about how it's important infrastructure is because we need the reminder because this is something that we seem to want to ignore. Um, look, um, we do like to ignore infrastructure. Obviously, this was an accident uh, that took place, uh, but uh, it's something that, look, the bridge needs to get rebuilt, period. And so Congress needs to get out their butts uh, and do more. All right, going to a quick break. Uh, we come back, folks. Lots more to talk about. Today is Jackie Robinson Day. Uh, his number, is re number 42 is retired, and all Major League Baseball players on today will be wearing his jersey uh, during games. Uh, and so we'll, we'll chat about that. Also, we did not talk about this here. Uh, I do want to talk about it. A week ago, uh, it was Hank Aaron Day. It was the 50th anniversary of Hank Aaron breaking Bay, Bay Roots record 714 home runs. And so I want to chat about that as well. In addition to that, uh, I, I, I wanted to talk about uh, a, a different perspective also. When it comes to Jackie Robinson going into, quote, Major League Baseball, or some would say white organized baseball, uh, and its impact on um, black-owned teams. Yep, it's a lot I want to break down. Plus, we'll be chatting with the uh, history-making gymnast at Fisk University and her coach. Uh, also, Supreme Court issued a ruling uh, when it comes to organizing uh, as it relates to uh, McCor's uh, community activist, uh, DeRay McKesson. Uh, I'll actually tell you what the Supreme Court decided or didn't decide next on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. I'm Faraji Muhammad, live from L.A., and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, Financial Literacy. Without it, wealth is just a pipe dream. And yet, half of our schools in this country don't even teach it to our kids. You're going to hear from a woman who's determined to change all that, not only here, but around the world. World of Money is the leading provider of immersive financial education for children ages 7 to 18. We provide 120 online and classroom hours of financial education. That's right here on Get Wealthy on Black Star Network. Hello, I'm Marissa Mitchell, a news anchor at Fox 5 DC. Hey, what's up? It's Sammy Roman, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, uh, today the Supreme Court refused to hear an appeal uh, by activist DeRay McKesson. This stems from 
a protest that took place several years ago in Louisiana regarding around Alton Sterling. Now, uh, of course, the, the decision would be whether or not the leader of a demonstration could be sued for an injury to a police officer, which was caused by another protester. Now, that leaves in place the ruling by the Fifth, Fifth Circuit. And the very conservative Fifth Circuit ruled that a person can be held liable for the violent actions of a random protester. Now, there still are other things that have happened in the lower court, uh, which was uh, stated by uh, Justice Sonia Sotomayor, but, but this really is a very dangerous case, um, um, Julian, because um, what you have here is in a police officer who says that he was injured by another protester, and so therefore he sued DeRay McKesson individually as saying, oh, you planned this, you organized this, when he actually said he didn't. So therefore, I am going to hold you liable for my injuries, even though DeRay didn't even know who the hell the alert perpetrator was. You know, again, we talked earlier about the retrenchment on our rights. One of our rights is a right to protest. And this is a right that we've seen over the past few years, um, protesters being uh, arrested, protesters being fined. And this is just an extension of that. There is no way on this Lord's earth that DeRay McKesson should be responsible for anything. But you have these unleashed, rabid racists uh, who don't want to, they want us to disappear. They don't want to see people protesting. They don't want to see people out there. So what tools can they use? What tools can they manufacture to discourage civic engagement? And this is one of them, having to sue the, the, uh, the leader of a protest, the so-called leader of a protest, who says he didn't even organize it. But you can just pull this out of basically thin air and say, oh, yeah, he organized it, so I'm going to sue him. No direct connection, no uh, straight line, maybe a dotted line, and not even clearly a dotted line. Um, it's absurd, but again, we're seeing our rights retrenched, and be seeing our rights retrenched means this has to motivate us to just fight harder. Um, the Supreme Court, we don't trust anything the Supreme Court does, and we know why. You know, this is uh, this also shows, uh, folks, uh, Renita, why federal judges matter. For anybody out there who's sitting here going, oh, man, I know you keep bringing this sort of stuff up. This is a federal lawsuit. And so if these judges, uh, if they frankly rule against DeRay, what they're basically saying is, oh, if anybody organizes a protest, you may, or if you simply, or if they just accuse you of attending one, oh, you could be liable if somebody gets hurt. Right. And so what this will do is have an effect on organizing and have an effect on free speech, because it could make some folks um, feel that they cannot take the risk of organizing a protest, which is generally open to the public, if they have to take responsibility for whatever happens at that protest. I mean, I do think this is going to be really interesting in the courts, because one thing about it, as they are trying to target um, and crack down on dissent, and they're trying to target black people um, standing up for, and saying what we need to have in this country as far as it relates to justice. And many of the issues that we are using our voices for, all of these decisions are still going to be tied to other things that are important to many of the folks who are bringing these lawsuits. So I don't see how you can say that a public protest, which is generally open to the public, the organizer of that is responsible for any and everything that happens and responsible for people who they didn't even invite who show up to the protest and, and, and call and have an issue. They're responsible for that. Well, then how is that different than having a open music concert and maybe in the crowd, somebody drinks a little too much and gets into a fight with another person. You're telling me that now live action or whoever put on the the um, the the um, put on the music event is now responsible for uh, things like that instead of individual responsibility. So I think that, you know, these the way that the Supreme Court is moving, where they are moving in ways that are very niche to fit their agenda are going to have larger ramifications that in the end will bite everybody in the butt. I'm a Congo. 
Uh, we also have to be mindful that this is also going to be selectively used because in many of these states like Florida and, and other places, which we also talked about last week as well, their the governors are introducing laws that are making it okay to run over for protesters if they feel like their life is threatened. And I guarantee, like, depending on who the, who the person in the car is, whoever they run over, they're not going to face particular charges. Let's also be mindful of the fact that this protest was to protest the killing of, of Alton Sterling. And those officers who killed him, there were no charges even filed against him. And so police officers, you know, we don't want anybody getting injured or hurt, but that sometimes also comes with the job. And so if people are going to make more of a bigger deal of that than the particular situation they were protesting in the first place, that also reveals the hypocrisy. And every state and every across the country, we need to be mindful, particularly with these Republican governors, they are going to continue to do things like this, and police are going to feel more emboldened. And I, we wouldn't be surprised to find out, even if some of these other protests, because you know we're going to keep protesting anyway, they invite some people there to be disruptors, some people who will be there who can actually attack police or, or hurt other people so these types of lawsuits can continue to happen to defame them. So this is a, a real problem, and it's going to be loosely applied primarily towards people who are anti-Trump in some way, shape, or form, or people who are considered to be, quote-unquote, anti-police, or Black Lives Matter activists in general. It's the hypocrisy of the role in that is glaring, particularly in the fact that this was a protest uh, after the mur after the killing of Al Alton Sterling. And the fact that the matter is, we're not getting justice for the rallies that we're showing up to in the first place, but these particular smaller incidents are gaining more attention and making their way all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, indeed, in, indeed. So like I said, uh, there are some other cases uh, winding its way through the courts, and so we'll be paying attention to this, but um, uh, we'll see what action takes place next. All right, folks, we come back. It's Jackie Robinson Day in Major League Baseball. Uh, we'll talk about that and also uh, reflect on last year when we were in New York City for the grand opening of the Jackie Robinson Museum. That's next right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network, live from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. I'm attending Hootie and the Blowfish is Monday after the Masters Golf Tournament. Can't wait to show you some fun time I had with Sterling Sharp. Uh, today's show is Craig Melvin. Y'all are going to love this. All right, back in a moment. in high growth fields. No experience is necessary. Learn at your own pace. Complete the online certificate program on your own terms. Stand out to employers, get on a path to in-demand jobs and connect with top employers who are currently hiring. Take one professional career certificate program or all six. Earn a Google career certificate to prepare for a job in a high growth field like data analytics, project management, UX design, cybersecurity, and more. All professional career certificate programs must be completed by December 31st, 2024. Scan the QR code to complete the application. There are 1,000 scholarships available. Grow with Google and J. Hood and Associates. Be job ready and qualify for in-demand jobs. Terry and I, we couldn't play in the white clubs in Minnesota. It felt like such a, um, you know, strength through adversity type mm -hmm. moment that I think black people just have to go through. You know, we have to figure it out. You know, right. we make we make you know lemons out of lemonade. But there's a reason we rented a ballroom, did our own show, promoted it, got like 1,500 people to come out. Clubs were sitting empty. They were like, "Where's everybody at?" And they said, "They're down watching the band you wouldn't hire." So it taught us not only that we had to be we had the talent of musicians but we also had the, ta have the talent of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. 
It wasn't like a seat at the table. It's like, no, let's build the table. That's right. We got to build the table. And, That's right. And that was the thing. And of course, after that, we got all kinds of offers. Of course. Right, to come play in the clubs. But we didn't do it. We you said, like, now we good. No, we're good. We're good. And that's what put us on a path of national. And of course, when Prince made it, then it was like, okay, we, we see it can be done. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, Financial Literacy. Without it, wealth is just a pipe dream. And yet, half of our schools in this country don't even teach it to our kids. You're going to hear from a woman who's determined to change all that, not only here, but around the world. World of Money is the leading provider of immersive financial education for children ages 7 to 18. We provide 120 online and classroom hours of financial education. That's right here on Get Wealthy on Black Star Network. I'm Faraji Muhammad, live from L.A., and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. Hi, everybody. I'm Kim Coles. Hey, I'm Donnie Simpson. Yo, it's your man Deion Cole from Blackish, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. National Minority Health Month. April's National Minority Health Month, folks. And look, there are always issues. We often talk about these things on this show. Uh, and one of the big issues that obviously impacts African Americans uh, is really mistrust of the healthcare industry. Generally, from Xavier University is Christian McG- Kirsten McGowan. Uh, so, Kirsten, glad to have you uh, on uh, the show. You know, this this point here, in terms of uh, in, in terms of, you know, trust in the medical industry. Um, and so much of this is because there are very few, when you look at the numbers, medical practitioners that look like us. When you begin to talk about doctors, obviously we have high numbers when it comes to nurses, but once you go into specialists, you see fewer and fewer of us. And so, frankly, for African-Americans, uh, we feel more comfortable uh, with individuals who look like us, uh, who know us, uh, and who have an understanding of who we are. Absolutely. Um, I'm sorry. I was waiting on a second to chime in. Um, I definitely agree with you when it comes to that. I feel like one of the other big pieces that kind of plays a huge role in that is honestly the lack of cultural competence when it comes to the providers that we do actually have. So when you're going to the doctor and, you know, they're looking at you like, oh, my goodness, my patient is non adherent. So that means that, like, they're not doing what I asked of them, but they're not thinking of, like, okay, maybe they're not doing what I asked of them because of, you know, social determinants of health or something that may be going on culturally. So you really have to look at the patient as a whole person instead of just looking at the numbers. And when you look at things historically, especially, you see that there's been a history and a pattern almost of you know, healthcare providers taking advantage of these minority populations. So it's understandable. And I feel like as healthcare providers, the best thing you can do to kind of combat that is really just look it in the face and say, hey, I understand that this may be a barrier, but I'm here for you. I'm here for this. Um, and uh, but, but one of the things that, uh, and we, we also always really encourage this, uh, is making sure that our people, are asking questions, probing, and forget this whole thing about uh, being the angry black man, the angry black woman. Your health 
is the most important thing. And you can be, you should be asking those questions and demanding those answers as a patient. I 100% agree with that. But sometimes when you see patients, it's kind of like, what questions do you ask? Because I come from a healthcare background and I'm going for my doctorate in pharmacy. I know how to ask questions in regards to my health. And I know how to say, hey, like, what about this? What are some side effects with this medication? You know, what does a successful treatment look like here? A lot of patients are coming in really blind and don't really understand, like, what questions they should ask. I guess the biggest thing that they can ask is, like, you know, what medication am I going to be on? How long am I going to be on it? You know, when do I come back? But outside of that, there isn't much dialogue because you can expect patients to ask, but how do you know what's a good question? How do you know what to ask, you know? Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, speaking of questions, let's go to my panel right now. Uh, Makongo, you first. I, I really appreciate all of the incredible work that you're doing. I have a question as it relates to you being a pharmacy student right now. We see a lot of conversation about how medical providers, because of issues relating to abortion and abortion care, are leaving states that they may be fearing doing work in. Are you seeing similar concerns as it relates to students who may not want to be in certain places because of the DEI backlash and how that might affect their ability to be able to be in schools and be in places like you are and also work with some of these patients who might be also having this level of distrust as well? I think one of the biggest things I'm seeing from a student perspective is that we as students are like, oh, my goodness, like we're really watching um, different laws and protections, especially when it comes to maternal health. Um, we're watching that being stripped away. And it's it's something that we're just becoming more fearful of. I haven't really heard many conversations of, oh, I don't want to practice in this state because of this um, the result of, you know, a reversal of a law or a clause. I haven't really been seeing much of that, but it's more so like, okay, we know that we have an opportunity to go into the healthcare field to make a difference. That's exactly what we're striving to do. How do we do it within these parameters? And how do we ensure that we're still making, you know, society a more just and humane space? But the reality to Omakongo's point, though, uh, that is happening. I remember... Uh, in New Orleans, um, <clears throat> I'm pulling the story up. Um, you had uh, an OBGYN uh, who left, uh, uh, who um, one of the practitioners. And so, what you do, you do. We, we are seeing that there are people who are deciding they're not going to work in certain states because of bills that they passed uh, dealing with LGBTQ, dealing with transgender, dealing with abortion. Uh, and so this is going to be uh, an issue that we have to face. I 100 percent agree that it's going to be an issue that we have to face. Um, when it comes to me personally, I plan to go back to like the Midwest. So when I think about practicing, it's not something that is in like the forefront of my mind. But I could definitely understand how practicing in a state like this could be very difficult and very much so like a big contradictory type situation because if you believe that you, you know, assist a patient no matter what and you go to bat for them no matter what, but then the law legitimately says that you no longer have that right to do everything in power for your patients. That's a scary thing. So I can definitely understand why some people are choosing to leave. Renita? Well, thank you for being here. Uh, just a quick question. Do you know of any specific resources um, that would help Black patients in particular advocate better for themselves um, when they go to the doctor? Because as you mentioned before, a lot of times people just don't know what they don't know, and so that can impact what type of questions they ask. So are you aware of any specific resources that can better help Black patients advocate for themselves? Absolutely. Um, one of the biggest resources I would definitely recommend is utilizing Google. And I know it sounds very crazy, but I would say if you are, you know, a diabetic patient, look up diabetes, try and understand what it actually is. There are so many different resources, especially on YouTube, that actually break down like the pathophysiology and, you know, the treatment uh, protocols for different disease states. So if you really are unsure of what to ask, you utilize YouTube, utilize Google, find out everything you possibly can about the disease state that you're currently experiencing or the one that your loved one is and figure out like, you know, 
what could go wrong? What medications are they typically on? What side effects um, come along with these medications? How can a person's life be altered due to, you know, this uh, diagnosis or due to the introduction of a different medication or a new medication? Find out as much as you possibly can utilizing Google, YouTube. Um, I would stay away from things like, you know, Wikipedia and you know, WebMD, just because sometimes it can be very much so filled with a lot of medical jargon. But if you're looking for something that's very easily digestible, definitely utilizing Google and YouTube to just figure out as much as you can about the disease state and then being like, okay, so what am I particularly, you know, worried about? And then you can go from there. Julian. Uh, first of all, thank you and Renita for raising the important issue of asking questions. And I think that often people, especially as they age or as, as if they are not uh, educated, ought to bring somebody with them. Uh, often, if you're also talking about your own medical situation, you could get confused and um, or overwhelmed. And it's useful to have someone, an advocate or someone with you, if, even if it's just a friend, to, um, to hear what the doctor has said. Now, um, I've done a little bit of work on health disparities and I'm, I boil it down to access, assets, and attitudes. And of course, those who have more money have better health care most of the time. Access, those who have access have better care. But the issue that I'd like you to address and that we need to deal with is also attitudes. Not only our attitudes towards health care, often not speaking up, uh, being distrustful of doctors, but also their attitudes towards us. Is all too often we everybody talks about the case of Serena Williams, but that's not the only case of a well situated black person basically being ignored. And we're seeing with maternal health um, so many deaths, women who are pregnant dying. So, how do, do they address these attitudes in medical school so that non culturally competent doctors uh, take, get, get the opportunity to look at this through a different lens? Um, thank you for that question, Sora. Um, I would definitely say that one of the biggest things that they teach us is to be culturally competent, but also to find a way to give your patient a voice. And I feel like a lot of times because of, you know, a multitude of reasons that a lot of healthcare providers don't really open up the floor to patients. And one thing that I'm seeing more and more of, especially as I do rounds and rotations in hospital settings and even in clinical settings, is that Healthcare providers are being a lot more intentional about saying, hey, like, am, is what I'm doing and the information that I'm giving to you, is this helpful to you? Are you able to actually digest it? And actually giving them that space to kind of level with you and say, like, hey, I understand exactly what you're saying, or I have no clue what you're saying to me. All I know is that I need to come back here in three months. So I feel like um, as a people and just as patients in general, we have to get really comfortable in saying, like, even if your provider does not offer you that space, take that space. If they're in front of you and you are not understanding at all what's going on, you can ask them, hey, can you break this down to me? One of the first things that they teach you in medical school, pharmacy school, nursing school, any kind of medical professional school is how to communicate disease states and lifestyle modifications in layman's term. So if you're not understanding something, you have to be really comfortable in saying like, hey, I don't know what this is. I need a little bit more help and assistance in understanding and digesting this so that I can get the best possible health, health outcome. Thank you, Sora. Appreciate All right, it. then. All right, then. Well, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, thank you so very much uh, for that. Uh, and again, I think one of the things that uh, we, we are constantly encouraging our folks, uh, again, is to take as much interest in your own health. Don't just, Absolutely. you know, yes, doctors are important. Uh, pharmacists are important. Uh, but ask questions uh, as much as possible so we have clarity on whatever information that we're trying to find out. Kirsten McGovern, thanks a lot. Thank you. Folks, we come back. We'll talk about Jackie Robinson Day in Major League Baseball also. Uh, we'll show you some of the fun stuff that took place here uh, at the Hootie and the Blowfish uh, Monday after the Masters Golf Tournament in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Support us in what we do. Join the Brandon Fuck Fan Club. Senior check and money order. P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C. 20037-0196. Cash out. Dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo's RM Unfiltered. Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. We'll be right back. 
Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. On a next, A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie. It's spring, hallelujah. But hold on, it's not all fun and games. With the sun and the warmth comes the need to clean the clutter mentally, physically, emotionally, socially. All of those things need to happen. Getting rid of the clutter and clearing the cobwebs in our head and in our home. That's next on A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. Terry and I, we couldn't play in the white clubs in Minnesota. It felt like such a... Um, you know, strength through adversity type mm -hmm. moment that I think black people just have to go through. You know, we have to figure it out. You know, right. we make we make you know lemons out of lemonade. But there's a reason we rented a ballroom, did our own show, promoted it, got like 1,500 people to come out. Clubs were sitting empty. They were like, "Where's everybody at?" And they said, "They're down watching the band you wouldn't hire." So it taught us not only that we had to be, we had the talent of musicians, but we also had the, ta had the talent of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a seat at the table. It's like, no, let's build the table. That's right. We got to build the table. And, That's right. And that was the thing. And of course, after that, we got all kinds of offers. Of course. Right, to come play in the clubs. But we didn't do it. We You're said, like, no, we're good. No, we're good. We're good. And that's what put us on a path of national. And of course, when Prince made it, then it was like, okay, we, we see it can be done. On the Black Table with me, Greg Carr. The enormous impact of race, education, and affirmative action in America, and how, believe it or not, white America is starting to feel a little bit of the pain. Dr. Natasha Waraku joins us with a case study of one suburban community and how it reacted when the minority students started to excel. And most people didn't say this explicitly, but was that, you know, the academics are getting standards are getting higher in part because of the Asian kids and that is making our kids really stressed out. So we need to reduce the amount of homework teachers are allowed to um, assign. She shares a perspective that you don't want to miss. That's on the next Black Table, only on the Black Star Network. What's good, y'all? This is Doug E. Fresh, and you're watching my brother Roland Martin unfiltered as we go a little something like this. Hit it. It's real. Seventy-seven years ago, Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier, becoming the first African American to play in white baseball. Yeah, I don't call it Major League Baseball because the reality is uh, the Major League talent was in the Negro Leagues. They were precluded from being in the so-called Major Leagues because of racism. It was racists who kept them out. And the reason I'm using that language is because I believe we need to use proper language. It was white organized baseball. And I think we do a disservice to our people and to our history 
when we call what they were doing Major League Baseball. You see right here, I have two hats. Right here is the Kansas City Monarchs. Right here is the Brooklyn Dodgers. And so I purposely have them. Yesterday I, uh, I was at the tournament here and I wore the Kansas City Monarchs jersey, number 25, Satchel Page. And I had the hat and today. And, and the reason that's important is because without one, there's no other. Without the Negro Leagues, you don't have Jackie Robinson going to play in white baseball. But we also have to call it white baseball because that's what it was. How they systematically kept black people out, even when Jackie Robinson was the one they allowed in. There were limits to how many black players could be on one team. Jackie Robinson was the first black major in, uh, uh, on the National League. Uh, then, of course, you had Larry Doby in the American League. But I also want us to understand that when we are factoring in our desires and, and, and what we're trying to prove, and, and let's remember, people, we can do well. We can play with them white boys. Where they knew that? But Jackie Robinson going to white baseball, breaking down those barriers, breaking down those doors, also serve as a death knell to the Negro Leagues. They accepted black talent, but did not accept black owners. It's no different when Fritz Pollard, when they had a better team, a better league before the NFL, they accepted black players but did not accept black owners. The NBA, there were black teams that had, had black ownership, but they wanted black talent but they did not want black owners. And so we need to keep that in mind when we are talking about these historical events because we have to recognize that when we are saying certain things, the impact they will have on those who are listening. A year ago, we were in New York City for the, own, for the opening of the Jackie Robinson Museum. We were the first news outlet allowed to broadcast from inside the museum. And the museum tells the story of Jackie Robinson, not just the baseball story. It tells the story of him becoming the executive with Chock Full of Nuts, the first black senior executive at a major company. It tells a story about his involvement in political campaigns. It tells us a story about him raising money for the NAACP at the Freedom Fund. It tells a story about him being involved in the opening of a black bank in Harlem. Why am I say all of that? Because Jackie Robinson Day cannot and should not be reduced to this jersey. Our kids should be reading, I Never Had It Made, the book written by Jackie Robinson. What I do not want us as African Americans to do, I do not want us to allow Jackie Robinson and other significant figures in American history and our history to be reduced to what I call a civil rights bobblehead figure. Because they're more than just that. Last week, last Monday, was the 50th anniversary 
of Hank Aaron breaking Babe Ruth's home run record, 714 home runs. He hit the home run, which you see right here. The 715th home run. He got death threats. It was the worst experience uh, because they wanted him dead. How dare you as a black man break a record from a white man, Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth was this national hero. In fact, when you see this video, I want you to see the black woman who runs to home plate to hug Henry Hank Aaron. That was his mama. Because she was afraid he was going to be shot. And she said, she said before they can get to him, they're going to have to shoot me. You will see it in a second. Henry Hank Aaron talked about this not being a gratifying moment. Now, now did y'all just hear that? You just heard the announcer say a black man is getting a standing ovation in the deep south. That was the baseball announcer. Who said that? I'm saying all of this because I fundamentally believe that when we talk about these things, we leave out the massive racism that Jackie Robinson, Henry Hank Aaron, and other ball players had to endure because we want to sanitize their story to make them more palatable to white America. Oma Congo, your thoughts? You know, uh, I, I think about Hank Aaron and I think about Jackie Robinson and how Hank Aaron talked about when he saw Jackie Robinson speaking when he was like age 14, that's what encouraged him to want to play baseball and that you know, Jackie Robinson, who was his mentor for so long, taught him to, you know, always bear down, but never bow down. And so we're talking about two people with incredible dignity. When you take it to the deeper story, we are still seeing the problem today where we are still too happy to just, like you said, have the bobblehead, have the standing ovations, have video play at center field, and, you know, and things like that. But even when you talk about Hollywood and you talk about we so concentrated on the show but not the business, when we, we get into these organizations and then we let the infrastructure that we build, we let it crumble because we're just so happy to be in that space. And with all of the resources that we have today, you know, we see what Ice Cube's doing with like the big three and the like, but we should be having more ownership if we're going to stay embedded in these organizations, NBA, NFL, and so on and so forth. We need to do more to demand more ownership. But it's high time we start re looking at doing things again ourselves and on our own, whether it's college players, you know, skipping, you know, some of these uh, racist white institutions that are back in DEI and start going to some HBCUs. There are so many opportunities rolling. Look, look at the Black Star Network. You could be all over all of these other spaces, but you chose to put something and break something down for us, for the people. And if we just had a little bit more of that mindset, we can create something better. Like you said, the Negro Leagues, we should have never let it fold. But we can create something strong, just as strong now. And when we see this today, people are still going to get mad at our swagger. So look at Angel Reese getting death threats, you know, just for winning that championship at LSU and daring to be herself. They're always going to be mad. They're always going to be frustrated. But we have to make sure that we have the ability to create something that we can actually own and not just go with the whims of what they're saying. So on this anniversary that we're talking about now, Hank Aaron last week and Jackie Robinson Day today, we should use this as a reminder that it's time to re-examine our role with these sports and all of these entertainment structures and start really focus on how we can build something that's going to be lasting for us. Friends talked about that at the Music Awards, you know, years ago as well. 
we have to do that now so we can set ourselves up to that next level so that people don't have to worry about taking 227 years before we equal the level of white wealth that we have today, that they have today. We can do better, and this is a great time to reflect on it. And I'm so glad you're doing this segment to speak on it. Um, folks, last year when we were at the opening of the Jackie Robinson Museum, got a chance to uh, chat with uh, journalist Howard Bryant. He is the author of a book on Henry Aaron. Just so folks know, um, Henry Aaron never liked being called Hank Aaron. Uh, and he would always he would always say, you always knew who his friends were because his friends called him Henry, not Hank. Uh, just want, to, want you to hear what, uh, what Howard had to say last year. Folks, Howard Bryant, um, journalist, author, books on Ricky Henderson, Henry Aaron. We can go on and on and on, all kinds of different books. Uh, just your thoughts on this finally opening five years after the groundbreaking. Well, I'm, I'm just pleased about it for lots of reasons. I mean, one, to have it open a week after Rachel's birthday and all of the consternation about trying to get it open and and not to be morbid, but we wanted to, her to see it. And after each delay and each delay, you were like, are we going to get there? Are we going to get there? Are we going to get there? And also, I feel very personal uh, for it as well, because they asked me to write you know, some of the museum exhibits, which has been which was an honor. So to see it, to see this this space from just concrete to a finished product, it almost feels like writing a book where it, it starts from nothing and then it ends up as something. And then now it's something for everyone to see. It's amazing. Uh, Billy Aaron is here, uh, the widow of uh, Henry Aaron. Um, so many people uh, who, who knew him, uh, who, who played with him. Uh, but them to also experience this. And the beauty of this, I was in there yesterday, is that it doesn't just talk about him as a baseball player. It's him in his totality. Well, there's no question when we were in the in the planning sessions of what this script was going to look like, one of the things that was emphasized to me over and over again is this is not a baseball museum. There's going to be baseball in it, but this is not going to be defined by baseball. And I remember stepping back going, OK, but how do we know Jackie? We know Jackie is a baseball player. We know what made Jackie famous. And what is the strategy and what are the calculations of do you emphasize the fan service? Why are people coming here? Or do you emphasize something else, which is, okay, here's the totality of the person. And I think that it struck a really great balance of making sure that you come for the baseball, but you stay for the man, or you come for the man and then you get some baseball as well. Uh, and going through it, uh, when you look at, uh, first of all, the NAACP work, when you look at, again, and in fact, I was telling one of the folks, I really hope that they hit TNT uh, to, to have that, that movie Andre Breyer portray in the court martial of Jackie yeah, Robinson, because sure. you can't find it anywhere. I said, because, again, that's a story very few people know about how this man put it on the line facing a dishonorable discharge, uh, and he did that before Rosa Parks. I mean, this is somebody who said, no, no, I, I'm not going to the back of the bus in at Fort Hood uh, clean. That's right. And and I think what's most amazing about Jackie, and it's always been something, especially when you look at the history of who he was as a person, where did that drive come from? Where did that courage come from? The willingness to do this, knowing the price. And nobody knows who Jackie Robinson is at the time, so everything he did was on principle. There's no grandstand in here. There's nothing performative about what he did. What's right is right. And that's it. I mean, he was a great college athlete, but at that time. But even before he was a college athlete, he was doing this stuff. Yeah. Even before, you know, when he was at Pasadena, there was always some moment somewhere where Jackie Robinson was involved in right and wrong. And so to me, it was just something inherent in him. And I just find him to be. So, uh, you know, inspirational is one word, but he's incredible yeah. because when you talk about who he is, or who he was as a person, it's not just the baseball. First black man to integrate corporate America, first black man to be on the broadcast and national you know, in, the, in the broadcast booth, first black VP in the country. I mean, all of these different firsts and 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 also on, on, on top of being those first, it's the vision that. Here's what I'm all about. I'm also about making sure that black people had 
agency in terms of their own money. So in terms of trying to start the Freedom National Bank, all of these things, they all add up to the same the same vision, which is I am here for my people. And then just have. It just brings um, OK. Um, all right, folks. Um, Rita. Well, I just think that um, all of this is massively more important today than it has ever been um, as it relates to having Jackie Robinson Day, having the museum and talking about these anniversaries, because we're in a time where southern states in particular, but, you know, states across the country have passed bills to say that you cannot teach um, accurate history. Some of these bills even say things like you can't teach anything that's going to make a white student um, uncomfortable. And so with the suppressing of our history being taught in school and us not being able to have accurate history taught in school for generations that are coming behind us, even having a Jackie Robinson Day prompts people to say, hmm, okay, well, why is Jackie Robinson famous? What is his story? And you can't help but when you hear his story, that brings about asking larger questions that inevitably get our history told. You can't understand why Jackie Robinson's, uh, what everything that he did was so important without bringing larger questions to your mind, like what was it like for other black players? Why was this needed? Why was all of the act that he was doing, you know, why was this needed for black people? What was the conditions of black, what were the conditions of black people in that time that would have made all of this very necessary? So I think that it really just kind of goes to show that, you know, with the suppression of teaching accurate history in schools, and I'm not saying that having Jackie Robinson Day or a museum is a substitute for that, but it is one vehicle that will help us to make sure that we are still teaching our history and still furthering the legacies. Julian. Yeah. Thank you for doing this segment, Roland. I think it's so very important for us to remember the history, as Renita has said. But more than remembering the, the, the day celebrates Jackie Robinson as a baseball player, but he was so much more than that. I mean, he was an activist. He put so many things on the line. He was selected because, theoretically, to be the first black uh, player, because, theoretically, he had a moderate temperament, but he didn't. He struggled with his temperament because, basically, he acutely felt injustice. And in, in feeling that injustice, he empowered our people, essentially, to rise up, to stand up. People were enormously proud of him. But I think that contemporary young people need to know his multidimensionality and not just that he was the first black baseball player. I think the other big piece about this, as we talk about erasure, because that's what's really happening, a lot of people would erase us, would um, basically want to erase our existence through these um, book bannings, through the um, outlawing of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and through any number of other things, it's important for us to stand and say, we will celebrate this man and we will celebrate his legacy and every aspect of it. Understanding that he was indeed a rebel, understanding that he was able to uh, hide that rebellion, but that the rebel Rebel in all of us needs to be awakened when we think about Jackie Robinson and the things that he was willing to do to make history for our people. I mean, he was willing to bridle his temper. He was willing um, to be in uncomfortable situations, willing to endure death threats, and willing to have people throw stuff at him when he was on the baseball field. And nobody, his teammates didn't stand up for him. Few stood up for him. But our people were there, and we were watching. And so I find this exciting, I, the museum being up, uh, you know, I love museums, and so anytime we have an edifice that's actually containing the history, I think that's really very important. Uh, so I get the segment is very important, Roland. You won't find this, uh, as I think Oba Congo would probably say, because he said it before, wouldn't find this in mainstream media, uh, but this is why the Black Star Network is, is such an important addition to the media landscape and a unique addition that, again, very many people would like to erase our history, or somebody probably said a little something, something. And, and not very much. And let me just, I know you're the big golf, golf lover, and uh, we know the, the Masters, which I hate that word, but whatever occurred. Um, and although Tiger Woods has, you know, he, he's 40-something and he can't play golf like he used to, he was pivotal to that game as well, and we should never forget him or Lee Elder, who preceded him in the game of golf. And, and then finally, we look at all this and look at this history, the, the words you used, sometimes you're smarter than I give you credit for. When you said, let's not call it 
Major League Baseball, let's call it white bears, we have to talk about nomenclature. We have to talk about the words we use and the credit we give, because were it not yep. for the Negro League, you wouldn't have had this. And the Negro Leagues were brilliant. They played circles around the white folks, and that's why they wanted Jackie Robinson, Hank Aaron, and so many others. Yep. Well, well uh, that is certainly uh, the case. Uh, and uh, we want to do this year. We want to close this segment out uh, because last year I also talked to another history maker, Billie Jean King. Just turned 100 a few days ago, and she's here to celebrate the cup of the ribbon. But it's about equality, it's about racism, it's about all these things that as the younger generations have got to learn about his, about Jackie's legacy and all he did. And Jackie was a real hero in our family in the 50s. So, you know, my dad played basketball against him. He went to Long Beach City and Jackie went to Pasadena City. So I've known about Jackie Robinson my whole life and he's always a hero in our home and, and what he represented. And how he did it, I have no idea. Putting up the racism, the slurs, the just how horrible humans can be to each other. And he just he just hung in there every day. And he, he, he must, I, I just can't believe how he got through this, um, but he did, and he's such a great example and uh, such a hero to all of us, um, everyone. And I know we're fighting racism, but I can tell you a lot of white people, including me, love, loved him, love what he stands for, and continue to appreciate the kids who are getting the scholarships. I think that's really important, uh, and uh, his legacy will truly live on with Rachel's idea of having the Jackie Robinson Museum. Going to a break, we come back, uh, we'll talk to a young history maker who made history this weekend for Fisk University and all HBCUs. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. I'm Faraji Muhammad, live from L.A., and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. Uh, this is Reggie Rock Pfeiffer with... You're watching Roland Martin, unfiltered, uncut, unplugged, and undamn believable. You hear me? History was made this weekend when Morgan Price became the first HBC, HBCU gymnast uh, to ever win uh, a U.S. Gymnastics Women's Collegiate National Championship. This took place in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Uh, of course, uh, Morgan, a sophomore, posted a 39.225 total score. Uh, she got a 9.85 on the floor exercise, a 9.85 on the vault, 9.8 on the bars, and 9.750 on the balance beam to secure the championship. Morgan and her coach, Corinne Tarver, join us now. Glad to have both of you here. Uh, Morgan, when you decided to uh, pass up other uh, well-known uh, programs uh, that had gymnastic programs, uh, the, you know, major uh, schools, PWIs, you were like, all right. Let's go to Fisk and, Fisk and make some history. Didn't <laughs> take you long. Yeah. <laughs> 
Talk about the experience. Talk about what it was like uh, performing this this uh, this weekend, and then of course uh, hearing your name uh, call as number one. Yeah, so um, I made it to nationals last year as well, but I didn't really perform how I wanted to. And I know this year I worked even extra hard so that I could hopefully get the national title. And so after my competition, I knew that I did like pretty good, but I honestly didn't know that I got first because I had to wait for the second session to go. But after I found out that I won, I was just really proud of myself and really grateful to be on an HBCU gymnastics team. Corinne, this is also why you wanted to uh, lead this program. Uh, and so uh, you got to be feeling pretty good yourself. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it, it's great to be able to show that, you know, like, like we like to say black girl magic, but that you don't necessarily have to be at a major school or a huge school in order to be successful in the sport of gymnastics. And you can be at an HBCU and still have, you know, a national championship and it leads to things such as uh, us being interviewed here today. You know, on that particular point there, I mean, obviously we see what's happening uh, when it comes to football and when it comes to basketball. Um, uh, but but what you're seeing uh, over the last Wednesday and Thursday, uh, I was in at the at, in Augusta uh, at, uh, uh, you know, for, for the Masters and uh, Mercedes. Uh, they had the Morehouse men's golf team there. Uh, we look at uh, some HBCUs are looking at adding lacrosse teams and other sports. And so uh, what we're seeing also, Morgan, uh, are black athletes competing in what we call non-traditional sports. It's not just about uh, if you're if you're an African-American that you have to be, it must be, you know, basketball. It must be football. Uh, it can be other sports uh, that that black athletes can excel at. Yes, of course. So for you, uh, when did you first start in gymnastics? Um, I started when I was two years old. Started was two. Uh, and obviously, um, that we often hear that, Corinne, uh, a lot of gymnasts start very, very, very young. Uh, have you seen uh, since uh, Morgan arrived on the campus, since this program started, uh, uh, have you gotten a lot of outreach from other parents uh, who now are interested in their children uh, coming to FIST to be a part of the gymnastic team? Well, we get a lot of you know, young kids that are wearing our leotards and wearing our T-shirts. And so we love seeing that. We love seeing. Um, and it's not even just uh, little girls of color. We, we see lots of little girls that, that have a FISC leotard on and, you know, those that want to be a part and want to do gymnastics, uh, sometimes it was just a, a pipe dream maybe, and now they're starting to get serious about it. I've had parents say to me, oh, great, now my kids wants to be on team, and <laughs> and that's just a lot of commitment. So um, not that they're not there for them. Of course they are, but it, it is a lot of commitment in the sport of gymnastics. So we're excited to see what the future holds, and hopefully this means that at the grassroots and the lower levels we'll see more young women of color. Um, first, y'all can, if y'all send a fist gymnastics shirt, t-shirt, I'll wear it uh, on the show. Mm -hmm. We'll bypass the leotard. Uh, let's go to, <laughs> let's go to questions uh, from our panel. Uh, Renita, you first. Morgan, congratulations. Um, this is such a heartwarming story. Congratulations to your big win and making history. Um, just know that whatever happens in the future, you have already done an amazing job. And this is uh, something that is just amazing for, for the community as a whole to see. I do want to ask you, what are your plans for the future? I'm sure you have a bright future um, ahead of you. Are you trying to make it to the Olympics or what, what are your goals for um, being gymnast overall? Well, first, I want to say thank you so much. Um, I don't really have plans to go to the Olympics, really just I've already kind of lived out my dream of being an HBCU gymnast. So I'm just going to enjoy um, the next two years that I have being on this team. Um, I my future goals also include being a HBCU gymnastics head coach. So that will be like one of my main goals after I finish college. Good luck. Let, me, let me follow up on that one, because I mean, obviously, 
uh, the Olympics is a whole different deal. So, so, so Morgan, are you saying that in order for it to go after uh, an Olympic bid, that that alters you, your, your student schedule, that alters your schedule being on the team? Or are you just not interested uh, in pursuing an Olympic spot? Um, well, for the Olympics, it's kind of hard. Well, it's extremely hard for gymnastics. And normally you do it before you get to college gymnastics. Um, not saying that you can't reach that goal after college gymnastics, but it is a whole different type of training. And personally, me, I did not want to train for that. Again, I just wanted to be an HBCU gymnast and win national titles. So <laughs> it's just not really in my mindset. <laughs> uh, hey, Corinne, can you explain that for people who really don't understand uh, you know, really, you know, that difference? Uh, because we've seen, you know, other collegiate gymnasts, uh, gymnasts, uh, you know, perform there. But when you look at many of the many of the gymnasts who, you know, who are on the national teams, they actually aren't uh, tied to any uh, university team. Yes. So what happens is um, when you're training elite, you're basically training 40 hours a week. There's, it's a full-time job. So in order to truly do it, um, you do see some college gymnasts do it, but it's really hard on the body because the college gymnastic season beats up the body as it is because they compete every single weekend. And it's a very condensed amount of time. So they start in January, they're done by April and they put more, they do more competitions than they do when they're in club gymnastics. So um, it's hard to then finish your college season and then all of a sudden do an elite season. So you don't see too many people try it just because honestly, the body can't hold it up very much. Uh, if you look at the girls, other than Jay Carey, most of the girls who did college gymnastics and are going for the Olympics have dropped out of school for the semester or for the year to train for the Olympics. So it's, it's a completely different type of training. Um, our athletes train about 15 to 20 hours a week, depending on the week compared to 40 hours a week when you're elite. So, um, for many of the girls, when they get to college, they, they really, um, don't their bodies are kind of already beat up a little bit and they're just not really looking to kind of maintain that type of training. It, it's a lot. It, it's a lot. And then right. do it and then only have maybe what four people, five people who are actually going to make the team. So to do so much and you have to give up so much to not necessarily have as big of a chance for them. They just enjoy college. Uh, I'm a Congo. Uh, Morgan, congratulations. Uh, this is really such an amazing feat. And we, looking at the videos, I, I want to ask you, how do you decide to just, or when did you decide to just get out there and be yourself? Because you seem, you know, very authentic. You just seem like you're just out there being free, enjoying who you are. And many times when we get in, as Roland was saying, these non-traditional spaces, we kind of feel like we have to conform and change up who we are. But you're just there showing that grace, showing that that blackness, showing that incredible skill. What, what's it like, you know, just deciding to be authentic and just getting out there and being who you are in this space? Um, I feel like it came from when I was a little girl doing gymnastics, honestly. Um, I've always loved to just put on a show every time I go out there because I would never want the crowd to, like, watch my gymnastics and feel like it's boring ever, especially in my floor team. So in my floor team, I really like to express my emotions and just show kind of my personality. And I feel like that just helps me. Um do gymnastics as well because I love the sport. I love my team, the school, and everything about gymnastics. So adding my little, like, personality and pizzazz just really helps me. And I feel like that differentiates me from other gymnasts. Mm -hmm. Julian? Well, first off, Morgan and Corinne, congratulations. You made HBCU history, and I think it's really great. Morgan, I enjoyed watching you. All that sass and all of that. And the grace, the combination, was amazing. One of the things we're seeing is HBCUs uh, going into non-traditional sports. Howard University just um, 
was the first HBCU to participate in a figure skating competition. We uh, see others um, fencing and golf that we see our African-American young men and women participating in. Were there barriers that you did not anticipate, Morgan or Corinne, as you entered this competition? I mean, our biggest barrier is the fact that we're an NAI school, not an NCAA school. So it's not so much connected to being an HBCU, but being um, not being in the same league. Um, so we, we have that obstacle. So we can't bring an entire team. And we can only bring one athlete per event plus one all-arounder, so a maximum of five. Um, sometimes this year, uh, it because of scratches and people who are injured, there were um, opportunities to bring more, but you know we're we're not really able to bring every athlete who qualifies. So that is a little bit um, disappointing, and it is something that we are working towards. It's something every year that when I sit in meetings, I propose that we be allowed to bring more athletes. And so I think and it's a matter of time before um, hopefully they they will change that and allow us to bring more athletes, but. I think about being in, in these spaces, the obstacles, I mean, w the one good thing about gymnastics is your your talent is going to speak for itself. So if you have an amazing vault, it's going to speak for itself. You don't, you don't have to convince someone you have a great vault. It either it is or it, or it's not. So, you know, a lot of the obstacles are self-inflicted, you know, it's how much you work, how hard you work, how much dedication you have. So as long as you are able to get out there and get the job done, who's who's going to take that away? Now, doesn't mean that that doesn't happen. Doesn't mean that the subjectiveness of the sport can't hurt athletes of color because it it most definitely does. But you know, all we can do is keep plugging away and you know training hard and really being better than everyone else. No, but other college athletes have talked about locker room sabotage, I like in this. Uh, strings being cut, stuff like that. Did you experience any of that, Morgan? No, ma'am. I did not. Gymnastics is not. Gymnastics is a different world. I mean, well, if you could have been there, you would have seen that the the athletes from, it didn't matter what team it was, they were all cheering for Morgan and the other athletes from Talladega. Um, everybody was cheering. It didn't matter wh who they were. So, uh, we've got an amazing reception from the athletes. We've got right. amazing reception from coaches, from the audience. Um, I would say that we, we're we definitely one sport that doesn't seem to run into those kinds of issues um, overall. We're, we're, I mean, it, but there's a lot of love overall. I mean, we, we all cheer for each other. It doesn't matter what team you're on. Everybody came to see, you know, Lindenwood, which was their their last competition ever, and everyone was there and in tears because, you know, we felt for the girls of that team and we, you know, we wanted to support them. So I don't think it really matters. Um, our sport just doesn't work that way. All right, then. Well, uh, Corinne and Morgan, uh, we certainly appreciate y'all joining us. Uh, continued success uh, with uh, Fisk University gymnastics team. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and shout out to former uh, President Van Newkirk Sr. for greenlighting the creation uh, of that team as well. Also, folks, uh, over the weekend, the North Carolina A&T cheer team, uh, they also uh, won uh, a cheering competition. Uh, some say they were the first to do so, but in fact, they weren't. Texas Southern University, they were the first, uh, but still big congratulations to North Carolina A&T. Uh, let me thank uh, Julian, uh, Renita, and Omakongo for being on today's show. I appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Going to go to a quick break. When we come back, uh, I'm going to share a little bit of uh, the uh, from the video from the uh, Monday after the Masters. I caught up with uh, Sterling Sharp and today's show's Craig Melvin. We had a little fun before we teed off today. I'm going to show you that when we come back. On a next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, it's spring. Hallelujah. But hold on. It's not all fun and games. With the sun and the warmth comes the need to clean the clutter mentally, physically, emotionally, socially. All of those things need to happen. Getting rid of the clutter and clearing the cobwebs in our head and in our home. That's next on A Balanced Life on Black Star Network.
Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, Financial Literacy. Without it, wealth is just a pipe dream. And yet, half of our schools in this country don't even teach it to our kids. You're going to hear from a woman who's determined to change all that, not only here, but around the world. World of Money is the leading provider of immersive financial education for children ages 7 to 18. We provide 120 online and classroom hours of financial education. That's right here on Get Wealthy on Black Star Network. Hey, yo, what's up? It's Mr. Dalvin right here. What's up? This is KC. Sitting here representing the J-O-D-E-C-I. That's Jodeci. Right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, fam. I'm about to jet out the door because Hootie and the Blowfish are uh, going to be performing uh, in a few minutes. And so I'm going to head on out. But before I do so, uh, a little bit earlier today, we had the um, golf tournament. It's, the, um, it's called the Monday After the Masters. Uh, Hootie and the Blowfish, they've been doing this for more than 20 years, almost 30 years, benefiting a lot of the South Carolina state golf programs. Uh, there were a lot of the young golfers who were out there today. And so it was great uh, seeing everybody out there. Uh, but before the golf tournament, I got a bunch of the stuff that I shot. Uh, but I had a lot of fun running into my man Sterling Sharp, a native of South Carolina, and Craig Melvin from the Today Show. Just want to show y'all a little of the shenanigans. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, he calls the rights and no, texts no, so he, so no. he, he's always in my good graces. He does not both. No, you know, he's but one you head. don't call. You don't really? write. Really? How you gonna really? Come, how you gonna don't, come don't down let me south? have to pull the text messages up. How you gotta come down south and not holler at you, dude? How you do that? But you know what? But I heard, because you wearing jacket today, I'm gonna give yes, you a reprieve. Absolutely. I'll give you a reprieve. But I heard, but I heard you swung by Beaumont. You didn't call. Hey, hey, you know what? Show, show did. <laughs> I show did. Oh, y'all good, baby? Yeah, I can't complain. How about you? Oh, good. I know you. I know you're hitting them well. Well, let's say, hey, Mister, it's, Mister, it's, I'm not going to the driving range. I, I, I did, and I went and parked some, and I'm back in the car. Wonder when the ten o'clock tournament gonna start. <laughs> hey, what time is it now? Ten o'clock. <laughs> Wait, what time is? He's, he's such a stickler. Ten o three. He's such a stickler for detail. I like starting on time, cause you know, you know what they say about those people and time. <laughs> You're right. You can't put that. You can't put it all on us. No. <laughs> Can't put it all on us. <laughs> no. Yeah, wait a minute. Hold what, we got, this is this South Carolina bag? What we got here? Yeah, I, I got to wrap my school now. Okay. Yeah, I got my hair covered. You know, you got to have your got bag with your name on it. You know, you oh, yeah. Oh, no, no. I got mine with my picture on and everything. Oh, my bad. Oh, I got to go. So I got to. Come on. Come on. You want to go? No, I got to I gotta up, up my game. No, I'm talking about, like, my show's on the side. Right. Uh, pictures on Ken it was saying, Ken on. said he saw it. Ken. Roland. Ken Duke. Ken Duke. Roland Martin. How you doing? Yeah, he said he saw your bag yesterday. It was, right. It's not. I don't know if I put that on. Yeah. No, no, no. It's, you know. But I, I almost brought my Texas A&M bag, but uh, considering how we've been beat the hell out of the Gamecocks since we got to the SEC, I don't want to bring up any, uh, you know, emotional emotions. Who's y'all coaching them? It don't matter. We <laughs> who's y'all? Coach? I think we we I think we lost South Carolina one time since we've been at the SEC. Hey man, y'all are ATM machine for coaches. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but long as we beat South Carolina, I'm good. Okay. And that happens consistently. <laughs> I'm going to change that because I'm going to get the job. I'm changing that. Are you going to get the job? Shane's doing a good job. Me and Shane going to work it out. Right, but he's still like, he ain't going to be the be, be AM. <laughs> <laughs> he got his one. That's all we need. We just need one. Hey. Right. I think they're like 1 in 12. Maybe 11. 
one in eleven. Yeah, one in eleven. I, still just one. It's better than one in twelve. <laughs> it's gonna be one in twelve in the fall. Uh, so Sterling, when are we gonna see you in Club Shay Shay? Oh, I was first before it blew up. <laughs> see, I don't. You know, but but be, you, gotta, you gotta come now for part two. No, 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 because they're too big now. It's been blown up. <laughs> you know, they talking about folks on that now. And I, <laughs> I don't want no parts of that. I'm incognito. So, so they got to go dig yours in the crates. Mine is in the box. Nice, smooth. Yeah, man. Loved you as a kid. That kind of thing. Yeah, we ain't going on nothing now. They too big. Now they too important. I don't want no parts of that. Hit them straight, baby. I'll see you after. All right. Good to have at it. Yeah, they will appreciate it very much. No, I haven't seen him. So which are your clubs, Craig? I'm using rental clubs. That's how serious I take the game. <laughs> I don't travel with clubs. Oh my god. They're up there. Oh my god. Yeah, I can't travel with kids and clubs. Plus we're going to Florida after this. So then I'm Yeah, you bring clubs with you. Oh, it's too much. So Fake using... golfer. I am. I've, I've never pretended to be a real golfer. <laughs> never pretended. These are my beautiful rental clubs. These are your rental clubs. These are my wife's, these are these are mine. Yeah. I went down to the range, and I, I, I quit. I stopped. <laughs> yeah, because they're rental clubs. Yeah, well, that's what I'm going to blame it on today, too. <laughs> oh, Craig, you're shanking. Now I'm rental clubs. <laughs> uh, uh, where are you? Where's your cart? Huh? Where's your cart? Oh, let, me show, let me show you mine. Uh -oh. Come on uh -oh. back here. Uh -oh. let, me, let, me show, let me show you mine, Craig. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. My, my, cra my, my <laughs> Craig are not hard to spot. <laughs> I'm not surprised by that. Mine not hard to spot, Craig. Now we can't see you smoking. Here we go. See, Craig, here we go. <laughs> here we go, Craig. Ah, I should have known. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, my God. Oh, you know, I should have known. Wow. You know, custom, customized is, clubs, you know. Beautiful. You take the game seriously. Come on now. Good Lord. Good Lord. <laughs> I don't think I realize you played as much golf as you do. Uh, yes. I played now 35 years. Good night. 37 years. Look at that headshot. Look at that. Come on now. That's branding, baby. You gotta put the gotta get, gotta get the show on the side. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Come on now. I gotta be honest with you. I've actually never seen anything like it. <laughs> never seen anything like it. I, I can't have a regular golf bag. No, you can't. Nothing, can't do it. Nothing regular. Oh, wait a minute. A stretching stick. Because <laughs> you could be already. Hold up, massager. Oh my God. Go ahead, and turn it on. You can give it a try. Charge. Light shows up at the bottom. Hold it down. Hold it down. Light shows. There you go. Press one, two, three. Three is a high speed. I'm in the wrong car. That's See, I, I come prepared, baby. Uh, Chase is lucky. Man, that's nice. I come prepared. You got to hit the shoulders. You got to hit the uh, hip flexion, the calves, thigh. Come on now. Man, the sad part is this ain't gonna help me at all. <laughs> Not <one minute. laughs> Oh, that's good. That's, hey, that's sta that stage oh, in the backpack. God. I got three of them. One in the home gym, one stage in the backpack, oh. and I got the backup. God. <laughs> Thank you. All good. See? NABJ journalists, NABJ members helping out NABJ members. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You too now? What are you doing? I walked over here. We're about to start here. Can you do my... <laughs> have a good time. All right, y'all. Uh, for the rest of the week, uh, I'm going to have some more video from uh, from the golf tournament. I'm about to head on out because the concert is starting. I'm going to have some of that for y'all as well. Uh, got to show you my man, Darius Rucker. And I got he wants me to do something with him this summer. Uh, nobody's ever asked me to do. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to tell y'all about that a little bit later. Actually, it's pretty cool. All right, y'all. That's it. I'll see y'all back in the studio tomorrow right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Don't forget to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Send your check and money order. P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C. 2003-7-0196. Cash App, Dollar Sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Roland
rolling that rolling mark unfiltered.com download the black start network app apple phone android phone apple tv android tv roku amazon fire tv uh xbox one samsung smart tv uh and so be sure to check us out all right folks uh that's it again i'll see y'all tomorrow uh happy jackie robinson day but while remember doing that don't forget Kansas City Monarchs and all the other Negro League for Negro League teams. So if you go to Kansas City, go to the Negro League Museum uh, or go online and check them out as well. So don't forget, there were many other brothers and they were major league players, the major league stars in the Negro Leagues. All right, folks, that's it. I'll see y'all tomorrow. Holla! Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real um, revolutionary right now. I- Thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?